Welcome to the weekly video update where I'll go over the action in the market for the week of August 7th through the 11th and then we'll see how things look for the week of August 14th through the 18th. We had a slight down week on a weekly basis. We're looking much more negative on the daily charts. In the short term we are considered oversold but we still have more room to fall if that's what happens. On an intermediate term basis we're just regular old negative. We're in the long term, we're still positive as long as we're above the 200 day simple moving average. However, on the weekly charts, we were seeing some extreme positive readings that maybe the market is dealing with right now. We're also having a difficult time getting back up after we hit overhead resistance. We've fallen back. On the weekly charts, things are still remaining positive overall. Some notes just before I get started. Please know that there's a PDF available in the description below every video that I post. There's a condensed version of the daily video. It's about 10 to 12 minutes or so. I just break it down to the main bullet points of what's happening. There is a full length version of the video that I post each day. That's about 30 minutes or so long each day. I do have a private Facebook group that you're welcome to join. So far, I'm really the only one posting there, but I'd like to get some back and forth going on if we could. I will post a new poll after I complete this video. I also try to really keep an eye on YouTube comments. I really appreciate a lot of the feedback that I get from you. I try to keep the garbage and crap comments away. If something is obviously posted by a bot, it gets deleted immediately. I want to have a real back and forth in the comments section. I also post videos on Rumble. Here is the link to the channel. For some reason, if you can't find me on YouTube, you can go over and look on Rumble. If you're on Rumble and you can't find me there, come over and look on YouTube. Also, I'm planning on doing a free online course in September. It's looking like it's going to be during market hours, probably a three-day session, one hour each, sometime midpoint during the day. Some of the things that I'm going to cover include my approach to technical analysis. It's a little bit different than maybe some of you have been exposed to before. I'll also be going through some real basic strategies. I'll go through the strategies, but they'll be at a more of a high level where I'll just kind of mention them. I go a lot more in depth about strategies in the longer courses that I teach and I'll also be talking about support and resistance. If you have any feedback that you want to give about this course, please feel free. At some point, I'll probably at some point I'll put out the word to send me an email so that when we get ready for the class, I can send you a link. I'll probably be doing it on Zoom. I've asked folks for the last week or so, do you want one class or would you like multiple shorter classes? And the multiple shorter classes seem to work best for right now. Let's go back and talk about what happened in this week's session. For the week, we were down 0.31% for the S&P 500. Volume is below average. We're in the middle of summer. The market's hitting a difficult seasonal time. A lot of people are away. We spent a lot of the spring and early summer really moving higher. It's probably due for a pullback, so you have a lot of folks that are kind of sitting back and just waiting to see how things will develop. On the technical side, we're still positive on the weekly charts. We're turning more negative, as I said, on the daily charts. We're also coming down to what could be support. Now, on some indexes, we're starting to lose support on the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ, and the FANG index. We're still above support on the S&P 500, and that's what I'm keying in on right now. We're coming down to the 50-day moving average. If we come down to that level, are we going to be able to bounce up off of that? Because not only are we in a weaker time of the year right now, there's also some research that I'll show you later on to suggest that we could be coming into a positive time in a pre-election year. The market is completely fixated on inflation and interest rates, which flows through into growth concerns. And then earnings season is still going, but we're starting to get near the end of that. Our trend is still strengthening, believe it or not. The ADX is still going up and it's above its moving average. On the daily charts, we're switching over and looking more negative in the short term, and we're possibly going into a trendless environment, where in the intermediate term, we're looking more negative and could enter into a trendless environment over the next day or two if things continue to chop sideways. But on the weekly chart, we still remain positive, and I'll show you that chart. For the week, the Dow was up 0.6%. Where the other indexes ended up having declines, the NASDAQ was down 1.9%, the S&P down 0.3%, the Russell 2000 small caps were down 1.7%. 
Here's some bullet points for the week. The Dow had a small gain while the S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell all had losses. The S&P did close below 4,500. That was kind of that mental area that the financial media likes to talk about. Well, we were above that, then we were right on that, and now we've closed down below that. Volume was below average, which probably can be expected given the circumstances of the market and the time of year that we're in. Global growth concerns are starting to grow. Remember that positive scenario that we've been latching onto? Well, now the market is looking more towards negative things to latch onto, and this is one of those. China came out with some trade data that was weaker than expected. A lot of U.S. companies do business with China, so that could influence their bottom line as well. Total CPI and core CPI came in as expected, and that came out on Thursday. So at the consumer level, inflation still looks like it's under control and actually declining. But then on Friday, we got the PPI. It came in hotter than expected, which spooked the market a little bit. It's also causing interest rates to really go up. But some of the previous readings that we received were actually revised down. So maybe that's not as hot as what the market was thinking. Moody's came out and downgraded the credit ratings for 10 smaller U.S. banks and put some of the bigger banks on a watch list. If you remember back to last week, Fitch came out and downgraded the U.S. debt quality. Now Moody's is coming out with their credit ratings. We're wondering what's going to happen next. But at the same time, the markets held up pretty well in the face of both of those downgrades. Here's a chart that I found with CPI, and it's matching what happened in the 1960s and into the 70s. If you were growing up in that time like I was, you remember this very well. The blue line is what happened from 66 through 82. The yellow line is what is happening from 2013 up to the present time, at least at the end of June. And you can see that they match each other quite well. Where do we go from here? Well, it does look like inflation is going to be coming down. But then after that, you remember back into the late 70s, we just saw a massive explosion of inflation going higher. So further out, things are looking more negative, but at least more in the short term into the end of this year and possibly into 2024, things do look like they're subsiding as far as inflation is concerned. Let's get into our poll results. The first thing that I asked was about a course where I said if a free live course using Zoom or Facebook Messenger, it looks like I'm probably going to use Zoom. Not a lot of folks tend to use Facebook all that much from what I hear. If I offered this in September, would this interest you? I only had four people respond. 75% said yes, and then 25% said maybe, but they need more information, and so I've been trying to do that in the daily videos. The next question, currently there are two main forces acting on the S&P 500. Number one, a negative technical picture, and we're still seeing that right now. Number two, support is holding up, which will win. Right now for the S&P, support is holding up, but for some of the other indexes, we're starting to lose that. 67% said the negative technicals will win. 33% thought that the positive support will win. The jury is still out as far as what's going to happen with that. We haven't totally broken down yet, but we haven't bounced off of that support either. Then I ask over the next two weeks, do you feel the S&P will go higher or lower? 20% said higher, 40% lower, 40% also said stay about the same. We really didn't see that much of a change, but this is only covering one week. That's the last question. Over the next week, do you feel the S&P will go higher, lower, or stay the same? 13% said higher, 38% lower, 50% stay about the same, and that's just about what happened, is we didn't see that big of a move, even though it was a down week. Going through some Isabel Net blog charts, the first one is just showing that U.S. government spending in the next 10 years will be on par with what we were spending in World War II. This is huge when you compare it to GDP. During COVID, it got up to 54% of GDP. Now the forecast is that we're getting up to 44% of GDP. Looking at the legal insider transactions ratio, we are coming down into this area where this could be giving us a bullish signal. It had become pretty high, but then now we're falling back, but we're not seeing a lot of follow through buying yet from the insiders. Also earnings estimates, and I put the red arrow on here, they're still looking good going forward. Whether you're Morgan Stanley, which is the dark blue, or the consensus, which is the light blue, everybody is predicting that future earnings will still remain positive, and that's justifying higher stock prices. Then we're looking at the fastest recovery in U.S. nominal GDP since World War II. Nominal means you don't take inflation into account, and it's just showing how GDP is really showing a lot of strength. 
since the whole COVID lockdown. Then looking at time series of the S&P 500 price, forward earnings per share, and price to forward earnings per share, what this is really getting, if you go back to January 2022 for the S&P 500 level, and then the forecast and P.E. ratio, we're back to January 2022 levels. I'm not sure how useful this would be. Then the net bullish surveyed sentiment. This is a combined American Association of Individual Investors as well as the Investors Intelligence Survey. It's getting to kind of a high level now, but not necessarily extreme. It could still continue to go higher than this. Looking at the percent of yield curves that remain inverted, it is still very high, but it is coming down. We saw one of the yield curves that I follow go back to being regular this week and then switch back to being inverted. That was the 30-year to the 5-year. It's not a real popular yield curve to observe. Most economists and market participants like to focus on the 10 to the 2-year or the 10 to the 3-month. We're still seeing a lot of money going into money market funds. This is a projection in the third quarter of 2023. Banks are not really giving anything as far as savings rates are concerned. So people are taking their money out of their savings accounts and putting them into a money market account that's giving them a much more attractive return. Fact set. Really didn't have as many posts this week, which was kind of surprising. It says S&P 500 companies see largest negative price reaction to positive earnings per share surprises since 2011. Just to kind of quote what they're saying, it says 84% of the companies in the S&P have reported for the second quarter. 79% of those companies have reported actual earnings per share above the mean earnings per share estimate, which is above the five-year average of 77% and above the 10-year average of 73%. When you take it all together, earnings have exceeded estimates by 7.2%. That's below the five-year average, but above the 10-year average. Given the strong performance relative to the 10-year averages, how has the market responded to the earnings per share surprises reported by these companies during the quarter? When you have an earnings surprise against what their normal price change is, when it's positive, on the upside, we see a 1% advance where we see about a half a percent decline to the downside. When they're negative, they get hammered a little bit more. 2.4% or 2.2% to the downside. Then looking at this on a historical basis where we're starting to underperform, we're down about half a percent overall over a five-year period of time. The blue area on here are the number of companies reporting surprises in each percentage range. And then the black line is the average price change. For most of the time, this has been a negative reaction to this. But when you get over here to the right-hand side, then the stock prices end up having more of a positive reaction. Looking at our charts and analysis, here's the intraday chart going back to Monday where we gapped higher and that was the most positive day that we saw as far as price action, but the market was in wait and see mode. We ended up gapping lower on Tuesday, but then we saw a really nice recovery. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of follow through to that. We chopped sideways on Wednesday. We dropped down. We did recover some of that, but then gave a lot of it back near the end of the day. It was like a real roller coaster day. On Thursday, after CPI came out, we had a really good start, but then spent the rest of the day going down. Then on Friday, when PPI was stronger than expected, we gapped lower, came back up, chopped sideways, and closed slightly lower for the week. And this only covers the five trading days of the previous week. All of the indexes ended up being down over those five days, with the NYSE being down the least, so that could be somewhat encouraging. That's a broad measure of the market with the NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 being down the most. Going back to the beginning of the year, the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ, and the S&P are still doing the best, where all of the other indexes are still up on the year. But when we go back to the all-time high, all of the indexes still continue to be underwater with the NASDAQ and small caps coming up in last place. Looking at different sectors, we had a down week with tech being down the most at 2.49% and discretionary. These are two areas that have really been doing well in 2023. The areas that did better, real estate, utilities, healthcare, and energy, these are more defensive. These are more value plays rather than growth plays. They started to see some strength coming into those areas this past week. That's what we're keeping an eye on is the relationship between growth and value. Growth is when we really see the market going higher. When the market shifts over to value, that means it's more defensive and we tend to go sideways to even down. Looking at the relative rotation graph, we still have discretionary doing the best overall. It's in this leading green area 
where communication and tech had been doing quite well, but now they're starting to show some weakness. And then if you remember last week's video, we had a lot of different sectors in this area. We're still seeing staples and utilities really lagging behind, but some of the middle areas are starting to show some improvement. This could suggest more broad participation. This could also suggest a move out of more of the growth areas back into the value areas. We want to keep watching that. For the week, energy was actually doing about the best, followed by healthcare and utilities. These are areas that have really suffered in 2023, where the rest of the sectors were negative for the five trading days for the week. Going back to the beginning of the year, we have communication, tech, and discretionary still doing the best. The area that's still down going back to the beginning of the year are the utilities. Then going back to the all-time high, energy is still in the lead, followed by industrials and healthcare. Slightly positive are the staples, and all of the other sectors remain negative. Looking at sentiment, we had got to the point where we were extreme positive with our sentiment. Now it's starting to come back down, but it's still positive. So when we look at the historical chart, we were well up above the 75 level, and we're starting to come down as the market's been under pressure. Looking at the active asset managers, I finally have a currently updated chart here. They had become extreme positive. Even though these folks are professionals, they try to beat the benchmarks, the Dow, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ. And so if the market's really going up, they're going to have to jump in. And since they're also human beings with emotions, they have a tendency to overreact as well. When they get extreme positive, that's when we start to use this as a contrary indicator. And since they gave us this real positive reading, it has been coming back down. We also see that on this other chart, where the latest reading comes in at 65.49. Looking at the VIX, it actually ticked down just a little bit for the week on the line chart as well as the bar chart, but it's still giving us pretty low readings in the aggregate. Looking at the ulcer index, we are seeing a little bit of increase in fear in the market. Looking at the right X bear bull ratio, folks are not really positive or negative right now. They're just about in the middle. The latest reading from the American Association of Individual Investors, it ticked down a bit where we had been at about 20. Now we're just under that at 19.2. I also follow the red line here where after getting extreme negative, it is showing some improvement, but it's still below zero. This is another sentiment gauge to say how would tech perform when compared to cash that I can just keep in my pocket. This is the one to three month T-bills, which is pretty much cash, and then we compare it to the tech sector. When this is going down, that means the tech sector is outperforming. When this black line is going up, that means cash is outperforming. And in 2022, that would have been a better thing to do. And then we saw this start to decline into 2023. It's ticking back up slightly, but it's not really shifting gears all that much. Looking at the economy, the latest reading for GDP now, the Atlanta Fed estimates that we'll be at about 3.5% to a little bit over 4%. When we look at the different forecasts, they have us at about 1.5% to 1 and 3 quarters percent on the upside to being down about half a percent on the downside. Here's a representation of the GDP now. We're focusing more on the second quarter and the third quarter where all of these are positive and this is one of the parts of a definition of a recession is that GDP goes negative for two straight quarters. There are other things that fit into that definition but this is just one that we keep a close watch on. Then looking at the spread between risky and not risky bonds, if this ratio was really going up, that would mean we're having trouble. This ratio continues to go down even though it ticked up over the last week. We're also seeing a real negative correlation where stocks are going in one direction and this spread is going in an opposite direction. So this isn't really giving us any concerns as of right now. The latest reading of the National Financial Conditions Index were below the black line and declining. If we were running into trouble, we would start to go above this black line. Then these haven't been updated since last week's video. We have the tightening standards, which shows that banks are being more strict with who they're lending money to and how they're lending money to them. We also look at the real-time SOM recession rule indicator, which hasn't been updated for a week. We're just a little bit above the black line. We get nervous if we go above the red line. The smooth U.S. recession probabilities, kind of the same thing. We're just a little bit above the black line. We get nervous if we go above the red line. The Brave Butters Kelly leading index. This is updated a little more often. This was giving us a bit of concern as it was going up. So now it's starting to top out, but we still want to keep a close eye on this. 
Looking at inflation, we did get CPI this past week, and then last week we got the PCE inflation gauge. And this shows how inflation is adjusting as these reports are being released. And overall, we're seeing a bit of a tick down with the inflation forecasts. Keeping an eye on the Fed, as of Friday's close, there's a 90% chance that the Fed is going to keep rates the same, only a 10% chance that they're going to raise them another 25 basis points. Now, this is going to change multiple times because the meeting isn't until September 20th. Then we can see how it has changed. The dark blue area is where we're at right now. This was a day ago, a week ago, and a month ago. So more people right now are in this camp thinking that rates are going to stay the same. But there's a lot of economic reports between now and that Fed meeting, and this is going to change multiple times. Keeping an eye on the Fed balance sheet, it is declining, just as they said it was supposed to. We're also seeing a year-over-year -year decline in the Fed balance sheet. Getting into our charts and looking at some breadth, we're still positive based on price and volume when we look at the advanced decline line. We're still hanging in there pretty good with the daily charts too, so this is a little bit more encouraging. The new highs, new lows, we are ticking down with the 4-week as well as the 10-week. We're still above this zero line with the 10-week moving average. We're seeing a trailing off in new highs, and we're seeing pretty much that same thing on the daily chart, but it isn't falling apart, at least yet. Looking at the advanced decline ratio, we're still above zero and actually ticked up slightly this past week. We're mixed on the daily chart, where our blue moving average, which is faster, it's below zero. The red line is still above zero. Accumulation distribution, and I've really been watching this. This is turning more negative on the daily chart. This tries to measure what is the smart money doing. We dropped below the moving average on the daily chart, and then we saw the weakness after that. We're still below the moving average as of right now on the daily chart, but longer term, we're still above the moving average. Keeping an eye on our trend. In the short term on the daily charts, we have gone into a trendless environment. Intermediate term, we're turning more negative. On the weekly chart, the ADX is still above its moving average and going up, but we're seeing the green line starting to come down and the red line starting to come up. So this suggests that we're still in a positive trend longer term, but that trend could be weakening. And if we see these two lines coming closer to each other, we could see a shift in trend, but we're not seeing that yet. Keeping an eye on the Arun, we still have buyers in control, but that's dropped off a bit. Also seeing sellers dropping off a little bit. We were pretty much flat from this week to last week, but the Arun oscillator continues to be positive since we're above zero. The mass index is not generating a signal right now. We only start to watch this if we get up to the dash red line and then to the blue line. Some other charts to look at. Here's a daily chart where we came up to the underside of this trend line. We've been falling back. We did fall below this pivot point. We're coming down to another pivot point, and we're also coming down to the 50 period moving average. That's what I see as a real line in the sand right now. Not necessarily if we break below it, it's where do we close at any given day. If we close below that level, we're already seeing weakness in other indexes, and that could shift things more negative. If we can bounce up off of this, or even drop below it and then close back above it, that would end up being more positive. On the bottom, you can see that pretty much for the whole week, we've been trailing off as far as volume is concerned. Keeping an eye on the trend channel, we're still above the midpoint, even though we're seeing a bit of a decline. The pivot points, and this was critical. When we hit this top a few weeks ago, that ended up being where we stopped, and we've been declining since that time. When you look at the 50 period simple moving average, even though we're coming down a bit with the S&P, we are still well above this moving average. Our long-term trend, even though it's pulling back a bit, still continues to be positive. The McClellan Oscillator, after getting extreme negative, actually bounced up a little bit, but that doesn't really help the summation index because anytime it's below zero, the summation index declines. It had got to a point where it was almost extreme positive and is pulling back, although we are still positive based on price. We also saw a decline based on volume, but we're still above zero. The Swinlin Trading Oscillator is below zero based on price and volume, but did tick up slightly. On the daily charts for the last two days, even though they're both negative, we're seeing price and volume start to turn up, and sometimes that can be a leading indicator for us, but other times it has led us astray. The bullish percent index, after having a real positive reading, is now dropping down and is below 70. That's turning more negative. We won't go full-blown negative until we drop below 50. Here's the PMO, which continues to be in an uptrend overall. We did decline based on price and volume, but we're still above zero. 
The PMO study, after coming down almost to this extreme negative reading, we saw a little bit of a bounce up with the percent of PMOs that are rising. We're still declining with the buy signals, and after being extreme positive, we're declining with the percent of PMOs that are above zero. The Bollinger Bands, after giving us an extreme positive reading a few weeks back, is now trailing off, but it's still above the midpoint. In the shorter term, our slope oscillator is starting to roll over. The TSI is still looking positive. The MACD, even though it's rolling over a bit, is not crossed over negative. The PMO and the PPO continue to be positive, and then longer term, we also continue to be positive. Everything on the daily charts is now switched over negative. You check in money flow. This is another smart money chart that I like to follow. On the daily charts, we're dropping below zero, where we are positive, but seeing a decline on the weekly chart. The Jacob oscillator longer term, we're coming down a bit here, but we're still above the dashed line where we're negative on the daily chart. The force index has gone negative on the daily chart, seeing some weakness here on the weekly chart, but still positive. The money flow indicator, after giving us an extreme positive reading, it is coming down. However, we're still above 50, so this tends to still be positive. The rate of change going back one week, we were barely down after having a down week the previous week, but we're still below the dashed line. Going back 50 weeks, we're actually looking a little better. We're going up and above the zero point. The RSI, after almost getting extreme positive, has been declining, but we're still above 50. The weekly special K chart continues to be negative, but it's hugging right close to this red line. We're still positive on the daily chart, but it is showing a little bit of weakness. The Stoke RSI, after being extreme positive, is declining and we're below the midpoint. The Williams Percent R, extreme positive, starting to drop back down. Ultimate Oscillator, extreme positive, also continuing to drop back down, but still above 50. The Vortex, we're turned negative on the daily chart. We're still looking positive here on the weekly chart with the green line on top. The Copic Curve, and I know I have that spelled wrong, we're starting to drop below the moving average. We lost this positive signal a number of days ago on the daily charts. When we look at support longer term, we're still coming down to this 10 period moving average. That's kind of lining up with the 50 period moving average. Is this level going to hold? If it does and we start to go back up, then we can just take this as more of a normal pullback. Other than that, we're well above all these other support levels that we plot on this chart. Looking at our different charts, we're turning a little bit more negative on the weekly hike and ashy chart. We're still positive with the Keiki chart, but we're pointing down with the black line. The Renko is still looking positive, and the three line break is still looking positive. Looking at the equi volume chart, we see red candles, which are negative. The thicker the candle, the more volume went into that move. When we look at the ease of movement, which tries to measure the path of least resistance, we're still positive going back 14 weeks, but we are declining. Keeping an eye on the point and figure chart, we had two new zeros generated here. We had been working off of a positive signal that went all the way back to May 15th. That is now gone and there's no pattern that's being found right now. Our different trading systems, we're neutral with the Elder's Impulse system. And this is a big change. We're seeing a dot on top with the parabolic SAR. We've spent about a week now with the parabolic SAR on the daily charts being negative. Now we're seeing that confirmed on the weekly chart. The PPO study, in the long term, we're pretty much flat. We're seeing a little bit of weakness in the intermediate term. We're dropping below zero in the short term. Some different daily charts that I thought you might find interesting. I've been following this really close. This is a trend line study where we had a longer term trend, then more of an intermediate term trend, and then a more shorter term trend. We broke below the short term trend, and we're coming down to this more intermediate term trend is this level going to hold? This is at about the 4450 level. By the time we get there, that number might change because as we go, this trend line ends up recalculating and coming up with a different value. But this is another support level that we want to keep an eye on. We're also working through the new 50 day cycle. That started on August 1st, and we've been seeing some weakness since then, and that's pretty much when the weakness started. The next cycle will end on October 11th. Looking at the Dow to transports ratio, even though it ticked up over the last few days, this is declining overall, suggesting that transports are outperforming the Dow, and that is typically positive for the economy and the stock market. This is more negative. The Nasdaq did close below the 61.8% retracement level. We were watching this, thinking that it might hold on to this level. So far, it has broken below that. Also, we broke below the previous high set in 2022 with the NASDAQ 100, and we're dropping below the 50-period moving average. This is also turning more negative. 
The FANG index also cross below its 50 period moving average. That's more negative as well. Keeping an eye on the broad market. This is from 2019 to 2023. How does the month of August perform? It's up 0.3%, 40% of the time, where September tends to be down 4.1% and is up only 25% of the time. Looking at just a blank chart of the S&P and the mid caps and the small caps, not really seeing any big divergences right now. The mid caps had been holding up better, but now they're starting to show some weakness as we work our way through the summer. The Dow was up on the week and still continues to be in an uptrend. The NASDAQ, even though it's coming down to this moving average, is still in an uptrend. NASDAQ 100 also coming down to this weekly moving average, but still in an uptrend. The mid caps also continue to be in an uptrend, even though they've been showing some weakness. Small caps just saw a recent golden cross on the weekly chart and continue to be in an uptrend, even though we saw some weakness this past week. NYSE continues to be in an uptrend. All stocks pulling back a bit, but still in an uptrend. The 30 biggest software companies fell through the 13 week moving average and now coming down to the 50 week moving average. Will this support level hold? But they're still in an uptrend. The FANG index is now dropping below its 13 week moving average. It already has fallen below the 50 period moving average on the daily charts. Is this going to present a problem? Is this foreshadowing more weakness or are some of the other indexes going to hit support, come back up? and then help the FANG index, NASDAQ, and NASDAQ 100 to perform better. ARK had a down week after it's been doing quite well lately. It's still in an uptrend on the weekly chart. The banks, believe it or not, they've been hanging in there fairly well. Saw some weakness this past week. Turning down a little bit with RSI, but we're still above 50. The MACD still continues to be positive. Looking at deposits going into all commercial banks, it did tick down just slightly in the latest reading. Then looking at Dow Theory, and I dissect this a lot more in the daily videos, we're doing okay with the Dow, and that's been holding on to support. The transports had been doing quite well, and we're starting to break out, but now we're seeing some weakness. We did have some upward movement in the utilities, but overall, they've been showing some weakness. Keeping an eye on the broad market, the CRB index did tick down a little bit. It's still in a downtrend, but if we go above both of these moving averages, that could give us a golden cross soon. And we're starting to see some strength in different commodity areas. Oil was up on the week and is now above 83. Copper is kind of chopping all around. We haven't come down to a death cross on the weekly chart where we did see a death cross on the daily chart. This tends to be used as a barometer of what's going to happen economically. When copper is going up, that typically means the market thinks the economy will be better going forward. If it's going down, it thinks the economy will be worse going forward. The dollar was up on the week after dropping below 100. It's been bouncing back and that's been putting a little bit of pressure on stocks. Gold was down on the week, but is still in an uptrend. Silver was also down and coming down to its 50 week moving average. Will this support level hold? Keeping an eye on bonds and interest rates. We're starting to go a little bit more negative with the total bond ETF on the weekly chart. However, stocks still continue to outperform bonds on the monthly chart. This is also something that's a little bit interesting when we take the one month yield and subtract the three month yield. We should always come up with a negative answer. We're coming up with an answer of zero. The last time we saw a real gyration here was during the whole debt ceiling crisis. Is this jockeying around suggesting that there's something in the background that is concerning the market? Looking at the daily chart of our yields where we did really climb over the latter part of the week. The weekly chart shows the UK in first place followed by the US and then Germany. Japan, we're still keeping an eye on that as they're implementing programs over there. If that starts to really run into trouble, that could affect the U.S. markets because Japan owns an awful lot of U.S. treasuries. If they have to sell those, that's going to push bond prices down and interest rates up. Some relative studies. First, we look at an intermarket analysis chart. Going back to the beginning of the year, stocks are in first place, followed by oil now. It's been surging lately. And then gold and then the dollar, where bonds are now down going back to the beginning of 2023. Longer term, when we go back to the beginning of 2022, right about the time we set the all-time high, oil is still doing the best, followed by the dollar and gold, where stocks and bonds continue to be negative. Looking at the NASDAQ 100 and S&P 500 ratio, it did decline this past week and fell below this moving average, but it's still in an uptrend. The S&P 100 compared to the S&P 500 fell back a little bit, but is still in an uptrend. 
Growth to value, still in an uptrend, but seeing some weakness as value outperformed growth this past week. Comparing gold to the S&P 500, we're seeing a death cross with this ratio and gold really underperforming the S&P. Also, gold is underperforming the dollar. The dollar was up and gold ended up being down, and so that's putting some pressure on this ratio. Bonds continue to underperform stocks. The low volatility stocks, even though they ticked up a little bit, they still continue to underperform the S&P when we look at this ratio. Discretionary, when compared to staples, is really outperforming when we look at this ratio. Energy saw a little bit of a surge, but in the longer term, tech is still continuing to outperform. Keeping an eye on some secular, meaning decades long, and cyclical, which can last years, trend studies. Looking at the NYSE Brett Thrust, it did generate a signal in October 2022, and that is still on the books. Also, back in March, we had a Zwag NYSE Brett Thrust that was triggered. That is still on the books as well. And in the daily videos, when I say the positive backdrops and scenarios are still looking okay, this is what I'm talking about. I'm also including this chart. This is the Zahorchak method, still producing a longer term buy signal. We're also keeping an eye on the weekly chart of the S&P and then this trend line. This trend line actually goes all the way back to the 1987 crash. I've just extended it forward where we hit 2018, then 2020, right before the COVID plunge. Now we've been coming back up to the underside of this trend line. Now we're starting to fall just a little bit below it. This is going to take longer for this to play out to know if we're going to break above this resistance level or really start to see some problems after hitting this resistance level. We're seeing pretty much that same thing with the NASDAQ 100 weekly chart. We're dropping slightly below this trend line. Another thing that's negative and in the background is the ratio between the NASDAQ 100 and the Dow. When we had a really high reading like we're getting right now, this was when the dot-com boom ended and right after that was the dot-com bust. Then it took us 20 years to get back to this level and then right at the end of 2021, we saw this ratio very high again and that fed into a very difficult 2022. We've been coming almost back up to this level again, and now we're starting to drop just a little bit. Is that going to be longer term negative for the market? Now, we could turn and start to go back up. It doesn't mean this is going to go straight down. We just want to keep an eye on this to see how this develops. Our momentum studies. We are seeing a little bit of a rollover with the MACD. The initial premise behind this was when we crossed above this trend line, could we take that as legitimate? At the time, the MACD was right about at zero and starting to look more positive, and then it's been continuing to climb since then, suggesting that this breakout is for real, and I think we can all see now that it really was. Just to keep an eye on the longer-term momentum, we are keeping an eye on this, and the MACD, even though it's still positive, is starting to roll over. Tom Bally from StockCharts.com and Earnings Beats, he has a free email that he sends out, and for the month of August, it's the third worst calendar month according to his research. In the S&P 500, the areas that don't perform well are energy, yeah, look at the past week, and tech, yeah, look at the past week. But we're coming into the middle part of August where we tend to historically see more positive returns. He also says that in the month of August, this is when growth starts to outperform value. Right now, we're seeing the exact opposite of that. And some of the industry groups that tend to be hot is computer hardware as well as computer software. So what's our outlook for Monday? And this is just based on the daily charts and this only applies to Monday. We will be continuing with the earnings reports that are being released. The technicals are negative and we're below support and the S&P is approaching its 50 day moving average. We won't be getting any economic reports on Monday. We're watching the geopolitical events but the market is fixated on inflation and interest rates. Here's the updated calendar for the upcoming week. We will be getting retail sales on Tuesday. We'll get industrial production and capacity utilization on Wednesday. We'll get the LEI on Thursday, and there's no reports coming out on Friday. Looking at the Stock Traders Almanac only for Monday, August 14th, we're positive with the Dow. We're neutral to positive with the S&P and NASDAQ. Jeffrey Hirsch from Stock Traders Almanac posted some updated charts. The dotted line here, and we pay attention to the green one, that's the S&P 500. How does it perform in the four-year presidential cycle from 1949 to 2022? The solid red lines are what's been happening since 2021 up till the present time. We're looking at the green line, and we've been going up nicely but starting to pull back. 
How does it look going forward throughout the rest of the year? According to this chart, we do see a bit of a recovery, then some weakness later in the year, and then we tend to see some strength going into the end of the year. And the other indexes pretty much mirror that, but they're on different scales. We've been watching this for a long time now. The NASDAQ coming into a seasonally weak time during a pre-election year. This was the end of July and into the beginning part of August. We keep asking the question, have we bottomed yet and are we going to see some seasonal strength come back into the market? So far, we haven't been seeing that. Then we look at the pre-election year in aggregate style. This is a little bit clearer. We follow the green line here. The purple line is where we're at right now with the S&P. Historically, we have seen some strength going into the end of August and the early part of September during a pre-election year after we had a midterm bear, which is what we had with 2022 being down. We will be on the 10th trading day of the month on Monday, where historically we see kind of mixed pictures with the dash lines, a little bit more strength when you take all the numbers together. Then here's another chart that he posted, August performance in 2023 in pre-election years from 1950 up to 2019. We follow the green line here where we tend to see some pretty good movement going forward from the 8th trading day through the 13th trading day, then a little bit more weakness, then a little bit of a bounce, then some weakness, and then some strength going into the end of the month. It doesn't mean the market's going to perform like this. This just measures what has happened historically and it kind of gives us a guide to use going forward to see are we historically positive or negative during these times. So our scenarios, we're going more with the down one on the daily charts because that's what our charts are suggesting. Our technicals are negative, we're below support, and we're approaching the 50 period moving average. We're not going with the up one now because our charts just don't support that. We also, in the short term, could be going into a sideways trend because the ADX has started to drop below 20. If we continue with this choppiness going sideways, the intermediate term might enter into a trendless environment as well. The warning signs, and this is based on Friday's close. It did look like the convergence of the short-term bearish signals all came together and that was helping to produce some weakness that we've been seeing. The longer-term trend signals on those weekly charts, it may signal that we're at a top for both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100, but we don't really know that yet. We have to give this some time to actually play out. Seasonally and historically, August tends to be more weak, but we're also entering a positive time in a pre-election year. The S&P 500 oscillators, as well as the NASDAQ 100 oscillator that we've been watching, are negative. The VIX has been climbing a little bit, but on the weekly chart, it actually declined. Even though it's going up, it's still showing that there's not a lot of fear in the market. The accumulation and distribution as well as the check and money flow are weakening and these are smart money indicators that I like to follow. Small caps and mid caps did cross below secondary support on calling that daily pivot levels that we've been watching. Cumulative new highs and new lows for the NASDAQ continue to show weakness. We're still above the three month yield level where we were at back in 2007. If we roll over and start to come down, we're wondering is that generating some kind of a warning signal? S&P 500 growth is weakening, but it's still in an uptrend. The weekly pivot that I showed you earlier, that's where we hit the top and we've been declining since that time. The parabolic SAR on the daily chart is negative. We also saw it just turn negative on the weekly chart. And the vortex is still positive on the weekly chart, but it has turned negative on the daily chart. And then earnings are released on a case-by-case -case basis. The positive signs, we have the seasonality and setups, those three longer term charts that I showed you of the NYSE breadth thrust and the Zahar check, those are the setups that I'm talking about. The daily special K chart is still positive where the weekly chart is negative. The longer term equity put call ratio, it's positive but it's starting to turn up slightly so we're watching that. The S&P remains above the downtrend channel upper line. We're still in a risk on posture but we're starting to see that weaken slightly. The S&P is outperforming utilities. The NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 are dropping below their 50 period moving averages. That happened on Friday. The Staples to S&P 500 ratio is declining. The Russell and the small cap index as well as the mid caps are working off of recent golden crosses. Small and mid cap growth continues to be positive and the financial sector has generated a recent golden cross. So our conclusion, we are negative and below support on the daily charts. We're watching the 50 period moving average. My gosh, if I said that six times now. In the short term, we're negative and we're slightly oversold. You could also say we are oversold. Slightly just means we have more room to fall before we get more oversold. 
In the intermediate term on the daily charts, we're negative, but we're still positive in the long term. One last chart to show you, going back to 1950, we're up and down 50% of the time during pre-election years for the S&P 500. Thank you. I hope you found this helpful. Please feel free to check out the other videos that I post. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you in the next video.